Good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for another wonderful program um, about the current exhibition, Norman Ives, Constructions and Reconstructions. Um, just a couple of moments of Zoom etiquette before we begin the program. If you're able to mute yourself during the main presentation with John and Leonard, we appreciate that. Then the last couple of minutes will be open for questions. And at that point, if you want to verbally ask a question, visually ask a question, you're more than welcome. Um, throughout the whole program, you are, of course, welcome to input questions or comments into the chat box for the Zoom call. So we welcome and encourage that conversation. An innovative artist and designer, Norman Ives pioneered the use of type and letter forms as primary subjects for his designs. A student of Joseph Albers, Ives taught at the Yale University School of Art from 1952 until his death in 1978, finding success in, multi, in a multifaceted career as an artist, designer, publisher, and teacher. This exhibition was co-curated with John Hill, president of the Norman Ives Foundation and author of the book, Norman Ives Constructions and Reconstructions. John T. Hill is a graphic designer, author, and photographer. Hill was Ives' student and teaching colleague at the Yale University School of Art, where he taught both graphic design and photography. Hill co-founded Yale's first department of photography and was its first director of graduate studies. For 19 years, Hill was execute, executor of the Walker Evans estate. He has produced a number of books and exhibitions um, on this iconic artist. Most recent um, was, well, recently was Walker Evans, Depth of Field, a comprehensive book and exhibition sponsored by the Joseph Albers Museum, and of course, Constructions and Reconstructions about Norman Ives. Um, we're joined this evening um, by Leonard Stokes. Leonard Stokes was Norman Ives's assistant, colleague, and a friend at Ives Sillman Incorporated art publishers in New Haven, Connecticut. He worked with Ives on various book projects, including Formulation Articulation by Joseph Albers and Walker Al Evans, 14 photographs. He also worked with Ives on a number of mural projects in the late 1960s and early 1970s, some of which we're sure to explore this evening. At Purchase College does School of Art and Design, State University of New York and the focus of his teaching was in color and drawing. He received the State University of New York Chancellor's Award for Excellence in Teaching. And beyond his work at Purchase, he served as visiting professor at the University of Pennsylvania Graduate um, School of Fine Arts and acting chair of the Department of Fine Arts. Um, he was a visiting faculty member in drawing at the Cooper Union, um, Erwin S. Shannon School of Architecture, as well as a guest critic at in drawing at Yale's School of Architecture. A collages and digital um, artist, Stokes has exhibited in New York and regionally. His work is in private and public collections. Among the, them are the Newark Museum, um, IBM, INA, and Hospital Corporation of America. He graduated with a BA from Yale in 1966, followed by an MFA and BFA from the Yale University School of Art and Architecture in 1969. And of course, we have on our call, Tanya Port, curator of the Lyman Allen Art Museum, um, assisting to also lead this conversation. So with that, I think Tanya will begin with a screen share for the program. Tanya, you have to unmute yourself. Thank you. Sorry. Um, all right. Let's, yes. Great. Um, thank you. Yes. So I think Leonard, you'll be, be um, or John, I guess, pardon me, will maybe give us a brief sort of overview um, for those of you who may not be very familiar with Ives' work and career, a little bit of discussion about that before we turn the stage um, over to, to Leonard for some commentary. Um, John, if you, we have just an image here of Ives and Albers that I thought might be nice to 
um, get things started. And then, sorry. Um, yeah, then if you'll just tell me, I'll advance the slide when you're ready to, to jump to the next image. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> well, since we're looking at a picture of Joseph and uh, uh, Orman eyes, I think it really does capture the relationship. They uh, had great respect for each other, and Joseph uh, had great uh, love for Norman. And he and his family were they, he and his family were close to the eyes family as well, at least to some extent, and mostly in, in business area. But it's a photograph that does, I think, capture the relationship. Could we see the next slide? Um, this is um, Centaur, which uh, has really become sort of a brand for the project. It's not exactly typical of many of Norman's things. It's uh, from a series of a short series of picture, letters that were overlaid and fractured by their transparency. And it has no grid and they're random. It spells the word Centaur. And it also spells the word Norman Ives. It's quite a remarkable work. Uh, I, uh, I chose it for the cover of the book because it is such a, uh, it's such a blast of color for the eye and it, 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 it demands you almost to pick it up and look at it. If we see next. L I Leonard, think we're jumping. Leonard's going to talk about this, I hope. Well, um, I, uh, I, I, Len Leonard hopes so too. Um, I, picked, I picked this one to start with, uh, not just because of its title, which it, I only later realized it meant a musical, a musical introduction, um, but I picked it because it completely um, um, subverted or undermined everything I had to say in my essay in, in the book that, that John uh, invited me to contribute to, because I speak at large uh, about figure ground relationships. And this piece uh, is, seems to be devoid, <laughs> completely devoid of the figure ground thing I laid so much uh, weight upon in my uh, written, written essay. Um, and I picked it because I really, it, it uh, befuddled me and it, I love it. And then I found it very, very difficult to talk about. Um, happily, I just realized after John finished talking about uh, Centaur um, on the cover that um, we can begin by saying, well, this, this piece has the same palette as Centaur. So it has the same ingredients, but it's a very, very different, different dish. Um, and um, I don't know, if, if, if maybe later during the discussion, people will uh, help, help me out with this. But uh, what came to my aid uh, this afternoon, um, uh, Anne and I went out for a walk in a local uh, nature preserve and we came around a bend and there was a kind of a, uh, a, a, a pond that formed adjacent to this little river. And the sound emanating from that pond was amazing. And it was a harbinger of spring. It was, peepers going, peeper frogs going nuts in the pond. And I said, that's it. This is what this piece is. <laughs> and, uh, and then I thought as, a, as an introduction, you know, as a musical introduction, then it, it connects in my mind to the opening of Das Rheingold, which is a D major chord that goes on for, it seems like 10 minutes without oh. anything else. So anyway, we better go to the next uh, slide before I get any deeper in trouble. Um, this, this collage I picked because it was a favorite of my mentor at Yale was um, Cy Silman, who was Norman's uh, partner at, in the publishing enterprise. And you know, it was through Cy that I became introduced to Norman because I, I didn't study him. I was in the, more in the fine arts program more than graphic design, but I know that this had a special place in Cy Silman's um, Part. And I think he likened it in what he said about it and maybe wrote about it in the book to uh, the work of Juan Gris. And um, certainly not in terms of, I mean, there were di diagonal kind of structures and led so many of um, Gris' paintings. But um, I think the other thing I would say about this is about color in passing 
and that is that it's uh, if we just discount the the darkest tone, the the blacks in it, it's uh, it's red, white, and blue, but it is not the Fourth of July, and we can see that over and over again in in Norman's work, um, a basic about reds and blues, um, blacks and whites. They play. I'm sure they're all over the walls in the exhibit, which I can't wait to get back in front of some of these things in person um, as soon as possible. So let's let's go to the next the next slide. Let's see what I put. Oh yes, okay. So one of the ways I tried to prepare myself for my uh, my contribution to this program tonight was by paging through the the wonderful book that John put together, a wonderful monograph on Norman's work. And I find that each time I go to it, I discover something that I've never seen before. Um, I think that is the, the benefit of the um, Yale education I had working with Cy and Norman and, and actually ultimately getting to know Albers a little bit um, uh, too. But there's always some, something more to notice. Uh, I think Albers used the word um, constellations with respect to some of his own linear work. And that that means that I mean, the, the stars are seen all over the planet, but each culture uh, has its own way of building pictures from it. You know? um, anyway, what struck me about this, this piece is the more I looked at it, the more I realized the little structural nuances that uh, Norman applied to it, I eventually saw, and just noticing it for the first time recently, that in this piece, it, it has an overall organization. But when you look within it, you'll, I began to notice that the, um, the, the, the lightest color in the image does not appear at the very, very top of the piece at all. And when you go down to the bottom of the piece, the, the middle color, the, the, the ochre, uh, the, the ochreish color uh, doesn't appear at all in the bottom and the place where they all mix together is in the middle. Um, and then with what I think in the abstract about Norman without having one of his pieces in front of me, I think of the grid, but this grid, I, you know, I slapped myself on the head and I said, there's no horizontal line to this grid at all, that the, the grid has been rotated 45, degrees and there are vertical lines to the grid, but there's no horizontal anywhere to be found in that, except maybe in the occasional random uh, letter form or from the, the, the typography that's uh, it's built out of. So um, let's let's see, see, remind me what else I picked. Let's go to the, let's go to the next slide. Okay, so this is a very, very early one. Um, I think I was, uh, I, I was still in high school when Norman, <laughs> when Norman did this. And I think I wanted, what I wanted to mention about this one is uh, that there, there is a, with Norman, um, I mentioned figure ground earlier, but a ground color, I think you could, one could say that there's this tawny, um, um, almost tea, tea colored, a tea color that's there, uh, that is the dominant color, it's there the greatest quantity, but what's remarkable about it for me is that it's never just the background in which the other stuff is placed on top of. That it's, it seems behind in some places, it, it comes to the foreground and other places and it kind of weaves its way through the whole thing. And I think that that's something for, for any viewer of Norman's work to, to look at. It's like nothing is inert Nothing is it just the background of something happening on top of it. And I think the other thing I'll mention in passing on this one is his sense of distribution within his palette when he chooses his palette. It's never the same percentage of any ingredient that it's more of this, it's less of that. He's, he's like a, um, a cook dealing with um, spices and flavorings. It's he doesn't dump the set, a tablespoon of the, every spice into the dish. It's like this much of this one and just a little bit of that one and all, all the in-betweens. So um, uh, John, I'm wondering uh, whether that was really, really old paper he used in that 
or whether he did in this piece something I saw him do later when I was out. Yeah, I think it's an old favorite. Okay, because I did watch him in his studio um, uh, paint paper with tea. <laughs> he'd, take, he'd make a cup of tea and then he would either use the tea bag or a paintbrush and say, well, that paper doesn't look old enough to me. So, if, uh, you know, Twinings is come to, gonna come to my assistance in this this one or another one. So. This predates all of that, which, I, which is really true. Okay. Uh, this is, uh, I just might add one thing. The uh, Yale Art Gallery, uh, in its wisdom, decided to deaccession all of their poster collections, oh. which they summarily threw downstairs to the graphic design department. So Norman had a lot of grist to work from. And this is, I believe, possibly from a French poster that he, he did early. And it's, it's, it's quite a remarkable thing. I, I love it. Me too. Well, let's, let's, see, what the, let's see what the next one. Um... Okay, this 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 happens to be um, uh, John and I selected what we wanted to to talk about uh, independently, but we both picked this one, and um, I think that I I had my own even though I was a, you know trained as a painting student and went on to do become a collagist. I, I, there was a time in my life when I did do some work on uh, with with letterpress and movable type and wood type even. And I think in this piece, which is like what 1951, um, this to me is like the I don't know the the seed for most of what came what came afterwards. Um, he couldn't, uh, John. You'll you'll correct the, my reading of this, but he couldn't have locked that type together and printed. This is multiple printings from type forms that he assembled in order to make the letters as information go away and become, here, here we're getting to that bigger ground uh, thing that is at the heart of his, so much of his work, where the, the white is as important as the black. And, and sometimes the black is on top, sometimes the white is on top, they're locked together. Um, well, uh, I think in, in the, the piece I wrote, the, the essay I contributed to the book, it's like music, the, the note sounded and the note unsounded working together to build the entity which is the, the piece of music or in this case the uh, the visual image that's made up of both so you you probably have other things to say say about it and um, save uh, later or pitch in now <laughs> well I, I think it's the, maybe the first example where he's consciously destroying the letters uh and turning them to form and uh he did it in 1952 and i think it's dated 52 and signed and it, uh, he was a student at that time, but I don't think it had to do with any assignment. I think it was a self-generated, self, self-propelled uh, project of his own. That that, that letterpress, Vandercourt Press, had a lot to do with the art that came out of uh, uh, the Yale program. Um, the same press printed Norman I's book called Eight Symbols, which was printed one summer by his friend his student, uh, Hiram Ash, a meticulous printer. So we should move on. Okay, let's go on to the next one. Um, yeah, here, and this one, it's, it's the, well, the slide isn't very sharp, but the reason I picked this one is that I, that I invite people looking at Norman's work for the first time to, to look at this in terms of um, veils of color and scrim and overlappings and interpenetrations of things. Each, each each box has a fragment of a letter form in it, but it's connecting outside of itself. So nothing remains an inert shape individually. Um, it connects to things and overlaps to things. I mean, it's like we're looking looking through. Um, um, well, I, I don't know how else, how else to put it. It's like veils and scrims that I wish I wish I had a, a pointer. But if you if you look if you follow the edges they interpenetrate a box and join up with something else and sometimes it's a it's a, a larger light entity or constellation or it's a dark like a dark that comes in from the top right corner and works its way all the way down to the middle or the light form from the the, the center of the bottom works its way up into the interior so these these so it's a, you'll see this over and over again, I think, in Norman's work, but it's particularly particularly true in this one, the looking through and the fact that nothing remains 
just an inert shape within itself or remains factual, it joins a dance with other, with other forms. Uh, I think it's a very Albertian thing, what he called sort of um, getting more bang for the buck. Um, there's more there that, to meet the eye and um, these, these images keep constellating and re making new constellations. So I think uh, let's move on to the next one because I want to get out of the way and listen to what John has to say. So here, here's another one that I realized, realized on multiple lookings is kind of a, atypical of Norman Ives because I'll, I'll, I'll be damned if there's a letter form anywhere in it. <laughs> there's, there's vertical black lines and horizontal black lines and the, and the, the diagonals come from the, they're kind of, uh, they whisper in this, they, they come by interrupting the horizontals and verticals. Sometimes I think of it as looking, um, I get a kind of a tufted, tufted uh, plasticity um, where, where it's been stitched and, and tufted. Um, but again, it's it, the, with the introitus and with this piece, it, it shows the incredible uh, range to his, his work. Um, there was, a, there was a universe within the letter forms and then sometimes he stepped out of bounds and, and did, um, did other things. And I know that you were gonna talk about the, um, the, uh, the architectural pieces, the, the mural pieces. Yeah. So some of these things are just inches in that dimension and some of them are what, what that Baltimore Museum one is 70, 70 some odd feet long. So 70 years, yes. Um, so this one and Troyes are sort of, uh, they're not so much outliers, but show the great range to his work. So I don't know whether I have anything, is there anything left in my, my queue here? Okay, well, this, this I would only be repeating some of the things I said about that early gray, um, gray and white, uh, gray, gray piece, black, blacks and grays. Um, and this is a, this is a beautiful, uh, here again, you can see how the, the, the diagonals are kind of a secondary, secondary reading. The, the, the boxy grid, the verticals and horizontals are sort of, sort of the primary reading. And then there's this secondary subtle kind of whispering diagonal passages that relate and rhyme and connect from corner to corner. Um, and I think John, uh, you pointed out that this is part of a, a larger series of a theme that he returned to over and over again at, uh, in different me media and then at different size and scale, so. Well, he did, he did it uh, as a bar relief. Uh, he did it as an oil painting where the, it's very painterly and it's hard to find this structure, but it is the same reverse ground. It was something he obviously liked very much and he, he uh, did it in a lot of different ways, a lot of different media. Okay. Well, I think, I think, uh, I don't know whether I have, um, I, um, I think we should probably pass, I think it's time for us to hear from you because um, rather than talk about the, um, the, the, the symbols. Um, um, shall, shall I talk about these? Sure, I'll, I'm, gonna have, I'm gonna hand it, hand it over to, hand it over to you. Hey, well, uh, Litter, thank you for those very uh, insightful words, I, I enjoyed you're going to learn something every time I hear you talk about eyes. He uh, in sixty uh, in in the summer of nineteen sixty, uh, he um, designed this book called Eight Symbols, and uh, he had a student, Hiram Ash, who was a wonderful printer and a great admirer of his work. And using the same Van der Kolk press as mentioned before, they did a hundred hundred copies of this book called Eight Symbols. Uh, Joseph Albers wrote an introduction for it, and it's really an iconic series. These eight symbols, uh, I think, stand up with the best symbols that I have ever seen anywhere in the world. And, and they all come from one place and one love of letter forms and master of, uh, master of forms. So can we see the next slide? Um, Sorry. This was just sort of the end, I think, of a couple of things. Oh, well, please do. But we could jump. I think this is now going into the material that you had requested. Is that all right? Should we stay uh, here? Yes. Uh, this is the first uh, piece um, that I wanted to talk about. It's a um, beautiful 
likeness of his classmate Shiva Kultur, and it's remarkably faithful. Uh, it's sort of a reflection of his 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 uh, love of Japanese prints because it has that same quality about it. But it's a striking uh, spot on resemblance to a remarkable woman. She was just absolutely brilliant artist. Um, and it's it's quite early. It's I think it's also 1952. And it's the only thing of this sort that he did. Uh, he just, you know, he looked, he said, look what I can do. Uh, I can make uh, I can make a very faithful drawing a likeness of somebody. So can we move on? These are wood block uh, prints made again on the Vandergroep Press, and they are reflecting uh, his his uh, studies with Joseph Albers about color. These are rhomboidal pieces of wood that have been inked and printed and then washed down and re-inked and reprinted in different configurations. Uh, he was fascinated by the whole idea of printing multiples. And he also was fascinated by the idea that if you're printing, you can, you, you can change the thing in between. Here he's changing the colors and in, in wood by cleaning up the wood blocks and re-inking them. And later on, he did the same thing with screen prints, where you could wash down the screen and put in a different ink and put down another ink on top of it. It was really quite a re remarkable understanding of the advantages of printing and what an artist could do with printing. Next. Uh, this is done during his period as a student. And it's, a, it's one of the only anecdotal pieces uh, involving uh, letter forms that I know. This is more about anecdotal shapes uh, that become part of a, a house. And it's much less about pure form of letters. And I, it's one of two pieces, some very similar to this. This is a smaller one of the two. But he uh, he's used letters to represent actual uh, parts of a house. Uh, so we can move on. Um, these are two or a pair uh, made from matchbook covers. A friend of his once brought him a collection of matchbook covers that was found in a, in a junk shop. And uh, he immediately sat down and, and cut them up, of course, into triangles. And he made this absolutely brilliant pair of things. And they have all the commercial hard colors and none of the nuance of the earlier things with papers that were used from uh, uh, 18th century broadsides from London, which gave a lot to some of the subtleties early. These are made from very garish matchbooks. And I think they're just remarkable in their energy and the, the way they pop off the page there. Next. Uh, this is, a, a piece, uh, it's a collage called Empiric, and it's remarkable in its uh, change of palette because there's none of that nuance of the earlier palettes. It's, it's very, very basic colors, hard colors of blues and reds and oranges. And um, he has then very carefully added a super white gouache to the counter spaces which has brightened it even more and made it even more uh, uh, sort of an explosion of colors. It's, it's, it's really a wonderful thing. And it's so contrast with the other earlier collages, which had all that subtlety. Next. Uh, these are two examples of uh, how he used found, uh, found pieces and made them work. The one on the top right is from a catalog of a house that sold rules for printers. And he has broken the rhythm of the, of the catalog of showing uh, all consistent rules by overlaying very subtle variations of white and ivory to interrupt that rhythm. And it, it's, it's very minimal, but it's such a brilliant idea to, to uh, build onto something that he found. The one on the lower right is much more complicated uh, and I have a hard time uh, comprehending it, but the background is German blackface. And I uh, wondered about that and I had it, ex I was ex showed it at 
RIT, in a, a very large exhibition there. And um, uh, two people walked by. One was David Godin, and I said, David, um, uh, what do you suppose this text, this blackface text is? And David didn't bat an eye. He said, uh, this is the, uh, these are pages from Tyndale Bible, second edition. Uh, it's, it's 1547. And I said, wow. And then the, the director of the uh, library in the, at RIT came by and he said, I'd like you to know that these are the pages from the Tyndale second edition of the, of the Bible. But then overlaid, he has found this Victorian decorative uh, a little, I, I don't know what the original intention was. It was a little memento or something, but the word um, Bible has been outlined and been made legible by this very fine Victorian script. And it's set on a, a blue and then on a black. I, uh, for years, didn't notice, and I think my wife didn't notice. But if you do look at the top, it says D O T H I L L at the bottom. Uh, my wife's name is Dorothy Hill. And it also has N S I, Norman Seton Ives. These were the, uh, initial letters cut from other pages, but then they were inserted in this, which I thought was a very brilliant uh, second or third layer of interest in it. Could we see another page, please? Uh, he had four sons and loved children, and uh, he was really a wonderful father and family man. I don't think these were made for his own children. Uh, they may have been made for Arnie Biddleman's children, but this is a cigar box that has been repurposed and the outside of it's been uh, uh, covered over with the large uh, Victorian wood type that I'm sure was printed on the press at the Yale uh, Art School. The other blocks are, are wonderfully varied and he, in the center of the one on the right, you see his wife and three of his sons. His youngest son, John Ives, who is now the CEO of uh, the Ives Foundation, had not been born. Uh, but there is uh, Sherwood, um, Peter and Norman, young Norman, and, and Con Constance Tavender Ives. So it's a wonderful, whimsical piece. So let's look at the next one. Uh, this is from a series of dozens of sketches that he made on tracing paper. And I, I had a hard time figuring out why in the world would he be using tracing paper? And then you think about if you're going to do a large series of these, you're going to be carrying them from your shop back home at night. You don't want to carry heavy boards. You don't want to carry a stack of heavy boards, but you could put in a stack of tracing paper and it would weigh nothing at all. But I love the way it has uh, exfoliated and these, uh, the blue is flaking off of the tracing paper. But there's, there are dozens of these that are made. Uh, they're really like color studies. And I, I have yet to find very many of them that, were, that would move past this stage of sketching. But they are absolutely stunning. I, I love the way the grid, he started with a, what is it, a 16 uh, grid, a grid of 16 squares. And then he's descended the series, the number of squares to nine. And then he's further and he's fractured it again and made it into a grid of four squares. I think it's just a wonderful piece. Next. Ah, Paul Rudolph designed the uh, new art building in, in, uh, in the early 1960s. And he uh, admired Norman's work very much. And he asked Norman to do the mural on the outside of the Dean's office. So this mural is still there on that very wall. They have had it conserved and they've now made a little Norman Ives shrine around it. Uh, it's untitled and it's 24 feet long dimension. Uh, they are pieces of black canvas cut and then glued on the, on the uh, little boxes, They're not so little, but little, little frame pieces of masonite that are covered in white canvas, uh, raw canvas, so you have the black painted canvas 
uh, glued onto the um, the modules uh, that make up this uh, 24 foot piece. It's it they, it's just still there, and I love going to look at it. They have maintained or they've replaced the original uh, Paul Rudolph orange carpet, which makes a very nice uh, contrast with this monochromatic thing. Next. Ah, this is, uh, he worked a lot with architects and one, especially from uh, Boston. Um, uh, and they did a, a number of commercial uh, interiors together. This is Cinema 3 in Orange, Connecticut. It was at the time the first showcase cinema and it, it was uh, to have three cinemas all under one roof was quite amazing. Uh, the architect, uh, whose name just escaped me, um, had four of these 15 foot panels installed in the lobby. So Norman had eight surfaces to work on. And uh, I always admired that. And then I looked at it more and more. And the more I looked at the eyes work, I realized that none of them were new. None of them were done for this occasion. They were all repurposed from smaller screen prints the orange and uh, blue and red one was done for his uh, son's um, marriage uh, wedding present. And he changed one element and the rest of it's all the same. And I think the one on the right may have been a Christmas card. So he was, he went from very small to very large. He liked, uh, he liked things that were gigantic and had a lot of uh, impressive size to them. Next. Uh, this is a uh, mural in the high school in West Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, it's 70 feet long, and it's it was just amazing to see this thing. I had seen smaller sketches of it, but to see 70 feet all lined out like this and beautifully illuminated was just such a treat to find it there. Uh, next. Whoops, we're out. Uh, well, I, 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 we could go back to that because I wanted to talk about, well, there are other murals that he, he, he we only saw two, two or three murals here, but there, there was a whole uh, body of work about murals. Anyway, I think that's probably enough said. Um, do Tanya, would well, you Welcome like to, to input questions on the chat. Um, I'm sure Tanya and I have a, a couple questions as well, but if you want to ask a question, yeah. um, folks are, are welcome to as well. John, I may have sort of stashed a few slides at the end here of some other pieces in the exhibition that we didn't, you know, you didn't specifically request a toss about, but- Oh, this is, this um, is a big, uh, here is the, yeah. the left is the, is the, is the mirror one. Right. Um, so nice to kind of be able to see that in situ. And let's see, this also- uh, We should talk about this for a minute. Uh, this is an important piece. In uh, 1967, uh, I've, I think set a, a precedent that I don't think it's ever happened again. He had uh, a Museum of Modern Art had, gave him an exhibition called Three Graphic Designers. In the same year, he entered this eight foot painting in the Whitney Annual uh, Show of American Painters. And this was accepted for that. So in the same year, he had a, a very strong footprint in the so-called applied arts and also in the fine arts. He uh, was friends with the architect for this school. It's called Stanford School for Children. And uh, his name is Egon Ali Ogle, a Boston architect who brought Norman to show him um, his new school. And Norman said, I will, I will bring this and I give it to you for your school. So it is still there in Stanford for the school for children. And they are uh, really, it's, it's like an icon, it's like a totem for them. They, they really love it. They make sketches from it. They do other little exercises based on this. It's been very successful. Next. And Corinne helped introduce some of the current teachers to me. So the Lyman Allen is going to partner with the school later this spring to do a, a program with the current students. Well, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. Yeah. This was a sketch for the Baltimore School, which 
turned out to be all black and white. But um, this was an earlier sketch for the, uh, I'm sorry, this was for the, the, the dining the lunchroom. And uh, here is what actually finally was on the wall in the lunchroom for the Baltimore School. Uh, it's, this was, was a proposed sketch, but then it finally it, it morphed into something more colorful. It's, uh, I photographed this uh, shortly after it was on the wall. It was quite fresh, it was really vibrant. Next. Are these murals still extant, John, or have they been destroyed? Oh, I'm sure this is, I, I suspect this has been destroyed long ago. And so are so the, so the things at the Cinema 3, they, they were destroyed. That's it's, heartbreaking. We, we, we're lucky to have what we have. Uh, yeah. Ah, we have to talk about this. <clears throat> uh, in his last... Uh, years or maybe one of the last things he did was on a piece of uh, masonite which was 11 by 14 inches he made a uh, a black and white painting uh, of this incredible figure ground relationship and in it you see some vestige of letter forms but not that many it's really about all about figuring ground but uh, when you enlarge, you decide to enlarge something that was drawn at 14 inches to 60 inches, you find that the lines are um, a little bit too raw. So you have to sit down and redraw every line, uh, which took about a week, but I believe it's worth it because it's, it's a stunning piece on the wall at uh, Lyman Island. Thank you for, for mentioning the time it, it took, because I was wondering from the matchbook collages to the larger scale is each one is incredibly meticulous. So you, you think that this one took about a week. How long would it take to do one of the ones where the oh, no, letters took, perfectly it matched about up? A week that to redraw it. it took me about a week to redraw this. Oh, okay. A week to redraw it, not even the initial conception. How, do no, you know no, how long no, he no. tended to spend on some of these? I suspect he did it in a day or two. Uh, he, he was very fast. Uh, how it's, about the it, collages? It, it's very late and it's characteristic of these chaotic, really dynamic figure ground constructions that he did toward the end called Duad. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's maybe the most extreme example of that. Yeah. Because for something like centaur, each time the letters cross each other um, and the forms align, he alternates the color. So when you're crossing from one to the other, it's a simple singular switch. But as you get deeper into the, the letters, it's quite a complicated patterning. Yes, it is. There seems to be some overlap with ideas or you know some of the kind of phenomenon from op art um artists and i wonder you know where you know, that's an interesting point superficially align. superficially uh, op, a lot of art art op art had to do with figure ground but mm -hmm. uh it usually vassarelli and i was looking at vassarelli recently uh, they are completely geometric and they completely repeat they are uh, a lot simpler and a lot less complex. And I don't think they're engaging for very long. So you think I Ives is say, sort of, we, has seen. more happening um, yeah. conceptually. Yeah, 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 I can see that for sure. We got a question in the chat from Eric that John, in a previous talk, you had mentioned a theater in Manhattan where there's a mural. Do you happen to know if that one still exists? I I would be surprised if it if it does. It was in the basement of the uh, what is the big hotel there on, on, on uh, is it the the big the famous hotel there on Fifth Avenue in the in the fifties. It was in the basement. They had a small theater there, and it was on the outside wall of this theater. And it was made of uh, frame, aluminum frame extrusions that he had cut and made into a diagonal construction. Mm -hmm. I, I, I have a photograph of that, but I, just, um, I can't believe it, it, was, it survived. Oh, then there's, a, there's another, there's a bas relief 
on a Third Avenue movie that was owned by his friend Don Rugo, and that one is still in place. Hmm. It's a white bar relief. It's huge. Hmm. It would be exciting to sort of have a little listing of, um, you know, places where one could go and see a couple of pieces in person. It would be. Uh, the one on Third Avenue is just behind uh, Bloomingdale's. And it's, uh, it's still an art theater. I think if you walk into the lobby, you can see it. There were art works from other artists. In the same lobby, he built a mirror box and set it into the wall. Uh, and we have had that rebuilt and it's just beautiful. And we opened up the backside, whereas it had been set into the wall, you could only see one side of the mirror box. We now have it as a freestanding thing. You can see both sides. We would have had it live in Allen, but moving it around and finding was, it's, it's a lot to do. Mm -hmm. Leonard, knowing that you worked on some of these mural projects, what took place when you were installing these works or, or painting them into a space? Uh, luckily, it, it had nothing to do with the installation, but okay. um, the, the mural project, I remember working on the, um, the movie theater panels um, mm -hmm. and they were, um, you know, I didn't get to really get to see what they looked like until they were installed because they were done in a, I think it was in a studio on Park Park Place. And yeah. so I was dealing with uh, horizontal pieces of, of masonite. You know? um, I'm reminded of uh, that parable about the uh, the Middle Ages, somebody walks into a town and uh, sees workmen and they say, what are you doing? And one says, well, I'm, I'm hitting a chisel with a hammer. And somebody else says, well, I have to shape this block a certain way. And then he asks the third guy, what are you doing? He says, I'm building a cathedral. <laughs> and uh, so, so, oh, that's what it, that's what it looks like when I just did this <laughs> section over, over here. But, and I hope my uh, hand was, uh, you know, no, nobody noticed that it was done, you know, no signature or anything like that, that they said, oh, Len must have done that part because it's messy or, uh, 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 I don't know whether Jeannie is, is she still there? Jeannie, did you work on those too? I know that Julie, Julie did on the, on the, um, the theater murals for the Milford, Connecticut theater. Did you do that? Did you have any hand in those? Well, maybe, maybe Julie did. I don't think I did the whole, I didn't do the whole, all of them by any means. Um, but I think that um, it's, it's, uh, it's very rare that, for artists to be able to work at the small scale of the collages and then to be in command of murals that go for uh, 70, 70 feet. I mean, the only other one I can think of with that kind of mastery was um, Matisse who did uh, big mural frescoes. And then uh, I remember the last big Matisse show I saw and maybe it was at the Metropolitan, um, there were some lino cuts that were about the size of postcards that just knocked my socks off and uh, and they were done by the same guy. And I think Norman had that kind of gift that he could, um, like, a, like a composer who could write uh, little solo pieces or quartets and then write symphonies and be in command of all of that. So. I think that's a very good analogy. Um, what's been wonderful with this series of programs is also recognizing um, Norman Ives as an instructor and the cultivated relationships with the students. I think each of the Zoom calls as well as the in-person gallery talk we had with you, John, we had Ives students. Um, so what was some of his instruction style like? I suppose you worked together for such a long time as well as the teacher and student relationship. Um, I can't speak to that because I was never Ives student. I was his oh. I was one of the elves in the uh, in the toy shop. Um, I wish Julie Curtis were still there because she did study. She did I'm, study. I am still here, Lynn. I am still here. Uh, and can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I'll try to turn this well, up. I mean, I was I was his student. I I I was a student of Norman Ives. 
and he uh, was a very subtle teacher, and it was all uh, very encouraging. There was never anything negative about it. He found something good to say about it, and he encouraged you to keep going. It was it was a very good relationship. Julie Curtis had a very good statement about that somewhere. I don't know if she's on. Uh, I'm here. It's, uh, I did write a short statement in the back of the book about Norman as a teacher and uh, also what it was like to kind of work as an apprentice behind the scenes with him. In fact, I had a short anecdote that I was going to offer that went back to the piece that we were talking about um, where he talked about painting on his, his pieces or his collage pieces with tea. Uh, I would help sometimes by taking work home at night um, to assist Norman and I would cut up some of those millions of triangles of paper. And one of the things that he assigned to me to take home were silk screened alphabets of letter forms. Um, Am I, are you able to hear me okay? I have a vocal problem too. Um, and I took these alphabets home and they were layered between sheets of cardboard to protect them. And I was taking them back to his studio on a very stormy morning. And I had my very small, at that time, son with me. And we were stumbling out of my apartment to my car and the sheets of cardboard tipped and the hundreds of triangles, which were separated into layers of different colors, tumbled into the mud. And I was sick. I didn't see how I could show up in his studio with them. But I somehow gathered them up and uh, got to his place nearly in tears. And it confessed to the accident. And he just chuckled in the way that he would chuckle. And he said, that's okay. I was going to dip them in coffee anyway. So he was he was going to change the color. He was going to age the background of the paper in those collage pieces, however he wanted to do it. And I guess I just contributed unwittingly to that. So he was very kind. Uh, he also was very generous in classes. If I'm not taking too much time, he once brought in all of his sketches to a graduate class um, for a project that he had worked on. And he was a man of few words typically in the classroom, but he laid out all of the studies that he had made um, for a project and walked the class through them so that we could see that he went through all of the things that we would go through of discarding work, trial and error. Um, and I thought it was a very generous gesture at the time. Um, I, as someone who worked with him as well as studying with him, I felt that he was most at home and in some ways his best teaching self mm -hmm. when you were working with him in an apprentice kind of capacity, which is how the field began in any case. Um, so I was fortunate to be able to work with him in both contexts. I'm going to mute my microphone again here. Thank you. That was fascinating. What amazing stories. Another question? Um, well, again, I think that you can see the the closeness of that relationship just by the support that this that the exhibition has received so far. So when you say that he was a kind teacher, that is, um, I think we see that through everyone who's who's come through with a connection to him as well. Um, and I'm also I over in overseeing education programs with the museum. We've had a couple of teachers come through yesterday, uh, this past week or so, as they're beginning to plan spring visits. And each one is really just so enthused to to work with this exhibition and, and share it with their students. So um, continuing that that legacy is quite rewarding. 
Yeah. Um, and then uh, just to, to share what's happening next with some of this exhibition on April next Wednesday on the 23rd, we'll have late hours with the museum. The museum will be open until seven o'clock. Um, we're excited. We have a screen printing um, workshop where we're coordinating with a local organization to do a screen print and that class is gladly but sadly full <laughs> um, but we'll also have late hours at the museum next Wednesday so folks um, if you can't come in our normal 10 to 5 hours um, next Wednesday is a wonderful time and the exhibition is open until the 24th April 24th not not March <laughs> Wonderful. Okay. Thank you. I feel like I, Eric Litke shared some amazing looking photographs, although I can't quite figure out how to open them while the, the Zoom is still going. <laughs> so I feel like um, I don't know if anyone else is able to because that would be helpful, but hopefully they're there and we can look at them after the fact. Eileen, do you know how to do that? Um, I'm trying to download one now, but I'm having a bit of trouble. What I can do is um, I'll come, I might email you, Eric, directly and see if I can um, get the images. And then I'm happy to share the images and the recording of the program. Um, uh, so early, early next week. And this will be available online on our website. And if you want, you can also see the exhibition, um, the exhibition opening. Um, that video recording is on our website as well. But yeah, so I, I might email you directly for those, Eric, but we appreciate it. I okay. might add that there's a lot more information on the IVES website. If you want to refer to that, you can tap into a lot of things that are happening and being done on the, through the website. Yeah. I'll send that link along as, as well, and the book. Yeah, well, a lot of that's responsible uh, for the, the doing of that was prompted by Corinne Forty and all the work that she's done to promote eyes has been really mm -hmm. very helpful and very important to the, to the foundation and to his career. Many cheers Thank to you. Corinne. Thanks to, to everyone who is here um, and representing these stories um, and the, the richness um, of Norman Ives' work and career and teaching. It really helps expand the story, you know, to really to be able to hear these sort of details about different aspects of his work and career. So we're grateful. Yeah. Okay. And with that, we've reached seven o'clock. So thank you all so much for, for joining us this evening. We hope to see you at the museum um, and we'll share a couple of notes uh, later on. So thank you for joining us tonight. Have a good evening. Tanya, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.